Good day, everyone. Can everyone hear me? With the, head, the headsets are working? Uh, terrific. My name is uh, Jane Nishida. I am the Assistant uh, Administrator for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office for International and Tribal Affairs. Regretfully, Administrator uh, Michael Regan uh, was going to moderate this event, but unfortunately he had an unavoidable and unexpected conflict, so he's not able to join, and I'm going to fill in for him. I know I'm a poor substitute. Uh, but I did want to say that uh, Administrator uh, Regan was very much looking forward to this panel discussion uh, because uh, he has uh, three very passionate uh, issues. One is climate change, environmental justice, and youth. And so this event essentially combines all those passions together. So I know that he very much wanted to be here today. Uh, he has been an, an environmental justice leader for all of his life. He has carried that message to us at the uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And in fact, when um, next week, he is going to be launching an environmental justice tour of the United States, where he'll be touring uh, what we refer to as EJ communities around the United States. Uh, so this just is a reflection, again, of his commitment. As I mentioned, the uh, White House has also made environmental justice or equity and climate change as priorities for the whole of government. So this is not only a priority for US EPA, but it's a priority for all US federal agencies. At EPA, Administrator Regan has instructed all of his offices to mainstream environmental justice into the work that we do, whether it's to clean our air, to clean our water, to clean up contaminated sites, or in my office, in dealing with our international and tribal governments. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples of what we are doing in my office, in the Office for International and Tribal Affairs. The first thing that, uh, or example that I wanted to give was we have a program with our um, uh, neighbor to the south, uh, Mexico, which is called the U.S.-Mexico uh, Border uh, 2025 program. And in that program, we work very closely with the government of Mexico and with state and local and tribal governments along the uh, U.S.-Mexico border to, again, clean up the air, uh, clean up their water. Um, and we have in our latest plan of work incorporated environmental justice into all of our activities. So we have a commitment at EPA. We have also now a commitment from our Mexican government parts. In addition to what we are doing with um, Mexico in terms of the U.S.-Mexico border program, we also work with Mexico and Canada, our neighbor to the north, on something called the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. And under this commission, uh, the, the under Administrator Regan's uh, leadership, we just held a ministerial meeting uh, earlier this summer and in that uh, ministerial meeting, we did two things. Uh, well, we did several things, but the two that I wanted to highlight is Administrator Regan announced the launching of what we call an EJ, uh, uh, EJ, uh, EJ4 climate uh, grant initiative. I had to make sure I had the uh, uh, name of the grant correctly. And under that grant program, the U.S. contributed money as well as uh, the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. And that money will be available to underserved and vulnerable communities, including indigenous communities, so that they can use this grant money to essentially help their communities adapt to the effects of climate change. So we're very proud, again, that we have cooperation from Mexico and Canada. In addition to that uh, grant announcement, uh, under, again, under Administrator Regan's uh, leadership, we organized an EJ and climate panel with youth. 
and I'm happy to say that one of our panelists, um, uh, Justin, is going to be joining us uh, on uh, later uh, remotely to talk about his experience in the United States with regards to what he is doing on environmental justice. So the final example that I wanted to uh, share with you is that we are also working with the Arctic Council. So these are countries in the Arctic region. And I'm happy to say that we have an initiative um, where we're addressing black carbon in the Arctic. And we are working very closely with the indigenous peoples in the Arctic region. And again, we have a panelist representing the Sami nations of uh, uh, the indigenous uh, communities here to talk about his experiences in the Arctic. Throughout history, youth have always been at the forefront of the social justice movement and making meaningful change. The topics of climate change and environmental justice are no different. Youth around the world have sparked a global conversation not only about climate change, but the kind of world that you want to have and to leave generations to come, to your children, to your grandchildren. And it, it is a vision that is safer, healthier, and more equitable than what we experience today. You have been the guiding light, the inspiration for the older generation like myself. So I want to say thank you. I also am very pleased that we have representation uh, today, both um, on stage as well as virtually, of those youth leaders who are pushing us uh, to do more with, with regards to climate and environmental justice. So what I would like to first do is to have each of our youth representatives introduce themselves. Uh, I'm going to start with the uh, representatives who are here in person, and then I will turn to the representatives uh, who are joining us virtually. So, Alexandra, can I ask you to introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your what you have been doing? Perfect. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alexandra Villasenor. I'm a 16-year-old climate activist and the founder of Earth Uprising International. And Earth Uprising is a youth-led climate education organization and we focus on peer-to-peer -peer climate education to empower young people to take direct action. And so I'm very excited to be here with you all. Uh, I want to give you all a round of applause for making it through these past couple of weeks. It's been long, but we've almost made it. So um, I'm very excited to be joining you all. Sorry, I'm trying to be uh, uh, respectful as uh, in terms of the COVID protocol, but so you'll have to forgive me if I have to uh, take a minute or two to uh, remove my mask. So the next panelist that we have is uh, Nezreen. Nezreen? Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be at the U.S. Pavilion once more time at this COP. Um, my name is Nasina Saim. I'm the chair of the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. I'm also the chair of Sudan Youth Organization on Climate Change, which is a youth-led organization in Sudan. And the next panelist we have is Archana. Juhar everyone. Uh, my name is Archana Soreng and I belong to Kharia tribe and I'm from India. I'm one of the seven members of United Nations Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. I'm also the member of Yongo, Official Children and Youth Constituency of UNFCCC. I'm a researcher. I have been working on rights of indigenous people and climate action. Thank you. And our last panelist on the stage is Lasse. Thank you. My name is Lasse Eriksen Bjorn. I'm working with the Sami Council and working in work related to the Arctic Council and the IPCAP expert group, Indigenous Peoples Contaminants Action, Action Program. Uh, I've also been involved with Norwegian environmentalist youth organizations for several, several years before that, and nice to be here. Thank you. And we are pleased to have joined uh, or joining us virtually our two additional panelists. And if I could turn to Justin to introduce yourself. Hello everyone, my name is Justin Anwenu. I'm an environmental justice organizer 
from Michigan. Uh, previously, I served as the environmental justice organizer for the Sierra Club, had an opportunity to intern with the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and I currently sit on Governor Whitmer's uh, Advisory Council on Environmental Justice, as well as Black Leadership Advisory Council. I'm really excited to be with, with you all today and, and to listen and to learn, um, but to also continue the conversation after this panel discussion. Yes, yes. And the next panelist we have is Chuk. Hello, bonjour tout le monde. Je m'appelle Chuk. Hello, everyone. My name is Chuk Odenibo. Um, I'm one of the founding directors of Future Ancestor Services, a Black and Indigenous-owned and operated youth-led professional services enterprise based out of Canada. It is a pleasure to be with all of you today, um, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. So you can see we have uh, six very dynamic uh, youth representatives to share uh, with all of you uh, here in the room, as well as those of us, uh, those of you who are joining virtually, uh, their perspectives. So how we are going to handle this roundtable discussion is that I have three guiding questions that I'm going to open up and ask the panelists uh, for their perspectives. And the first guiding question is, uh, uh, sorry, the first guiding question uh, I would like to ask the panelists is, what was the moment that inspired you to become a climate and environmental justice advocate? And maybe if I can begin with Alexandra. Yeah, so I got involved in climate activism about three years ago. And at the time, I was living in New York City, but I was born and raised in Northern California. And so at the time when I was in New York, I ended up going back and forth a bit and visiting my hometown and my family. And so in a visit back to Northern California in November of 2018, I was there when the campfire happened in Paradise, California. And at the time, that was California's worst wildfire. It, at one point it was the worst air quality in the world and it ended up blanketing the area in thick unbreathable smoke. And so it was, it was a very scary experience because at the time there wasn't that much education about how to keep yourself safe from wildfires. And so my family, we rolled up wet towels and put them under windows and doors to keep the smoke from coming in. And so I have asthma and it was a very scary experience. And so I went back to New York City early from that trip home and I remember just being very upset because the fire was still going on and I wanted to find out why California was having all of these wildfires. And so I started re researching about it and I started to see the connection between climate change and California's wildfires. And since then, California has had our first ever gigafire. Our wildfire season isn't one season, it's the entire year. And so when I started researching it and I saw that connection, that was a big motivator for me to do something because I was feeling a lot of climate anxiety and eco grief. And so I decided to take all of that and turn it into action. And I started striking in front of the United Nations headquarters in solidarity with the Fridays for Future movement. And I did that on December 14th of 2018 and I striked all the way up until the beginning of the pandemic. So over a year of striking. And I think that it was a very, um, it was a moment where I really knew I had to do something. And so I always tell everyone to find your climate story and how you're being impacted by climate change and then also turn that into action and find out what you want to do about it. Thank you, Alexandra. If I could ask uh, Nazine. Yeah, um, I think um, living in a country like Sudan where everything is um, not literally on fire, but on fire, um, makes us always realize that um, we have to do something about the reality that we are living. And I think um, uh, we had, like a, a, a first year student, I had a lot, of, uh, a lot of free time because our university used to close a lot because of political issues. So I was a freshman and university closed for three months. I didn't have anything to actually do at that time. So I decided to do um, environmental and, um, and uh, like activism at that uh, time. 
but uh, also because, and I always tell this story, I always had a passion about political science, but I decided to do natural science in my bachelor degree, so I did physics. And I was thinking how to link both, uh, both together. And um, the obvious answer, thanks to Google, was um, science diplomacy, which with you, where you actually use science in diplomatic discussion. And uh, two big topics in science diplomacy was water, because countries share waters together. And the other thing was, of course, climate change, because there is a lot of science in climate change, but also there's a lot of political discussions happening. Um, and that's how I got to, um, to know climate change on paper. But actually, I, we lived climate change. We still live in climate change every day. And, and I really wish I could have the privilege of speaking about the future impact of climate change because unfortunately for us, it's not really future. And it's impacting everything, the, uh, the food security, the water security, the human security. Um, and of course, it's impacting um, the development of the country. So, yeah, I think the, the movement of climate change is, that is growing, but also not silo from the other movements because everything is interlinked and climate change is not an isolated island from the other problems that the country have. Thank you. Uh, Ar Archa, uh, Archana? Yeah. Uh, so for me, uh, it's not one particular incident, but it's a journey uh, which has helped me to be uh, part of this climate action discourse and work for it. So I would like to start by saying that my grandfather was a pioneer of community-led forest protection practices in my own village. And he was of the staunch believer that if we have a sustainable relationship with nature, then we will have a sustainable life. It also comes down to me, uh, like my name. My name is Archana Soreng. Uh, in my tribe, the language of my tribe, the meaning of my surname is rock. And there are many similar surnames in my community like uh, Ba, which means wheat, Kerketa, which means bird, Bilung, which means salt, Dung Dung, which means, uh, which means fish. So when we say uh, that for us in my community, uh, we are not mere part of nature, but we are also nature. Nature is a source of identity, culture, tradition and language. And my father was also an indigenous healthcare practitioner. And given the situation of my village and of my community, both of my parents said, if you really want to contribute back to your society, you have to enter into policy making spaces. And that what has stayed with me, which led me to pursue political science and do masters. And when I was pursuing masters in regulatory governance, I also had a subject called environmental regulation. And while pursuing environmental regulation was really eye-opening for me because a lot of literature which we were reading was about my tradition and practices, about the community-led tradition and practices, I felt it was really ironic uh, because having grown up with a feeling of and uh, with the atmosphere where we have been told uh, that our tradition and language and uh, culture is backward we are savage and uh, making us feel inferior of our identity and then all of a sudden reading literatures glorifying our tradition and culture which also made me realized that how important it is for us indigenous community to speak up for ourselves to write our own histories and culture and tradition because most of those literatures were not written by us. And third, uh, my father passed uh, away when I was pursuing masters, which was again a very critical uh, point of uh, time in my life because that was when I was realizing that how, uh, uh, what is our tradition and culture and what the world is saying about, which also made me realize that our ancestors, our elders will not be with us forever and we need to go back to them, learn from them because we as a generation are the ones we can take to the upcoming generation we are the bridge and if we don't go back and learn uh, our traditional knowledge and practices we will lose out uh, on our uh, tradition and knowledge which made me realize to work as a researcher and keep advocating for the indigenous perspective in climate action thank you very much uh, Lasse yeah I don't think it's really a question of when I became part of a climate movement I think it's more a question of when do people stop be stop being involved in climate movements I am living in the Arctic. We already see the temperature rise of 1.5 degrees. The weather from when I was a child is way different than it's now. The winters are shorter. 
we already see the effects of climate change. And I think everyone would need to take, make a decision to not be involved in the climate movement, to not be involved in climate change. And I have not found a reason to stop. We are seeing right now that solutions are not being found. We need to change society. We need to change the way we are living. And that's not happening. So that's why I'm still here talking. Thank you. Justin. Thank you for the question. So, you know, for most of my life, I've been interested in, in medicine and public health. This carried me through four years of pre-medical studies until 2017 when Hurricane Harvey, which is a hurricane that hit uh, Houston, Texas, uh, caused $125 billion in damages, a number of lives lost, and it pushed me into environmental justice work. During the storm, I worked with a lot of other students to match and organize people to shelters and homes and religious centers to clean debris. And it was through this process that I learned about underlying injustice that drives health disparities. So, you know, given poor zoning laws and proper uh, emergency management protocols, residential segregation, the same Houstonians who faced severe consequences, health consequences, as the city's refineries and Superfund sites flooded, carrying benzene and other toxins, these same communities had a hard time recovering even a year after the storm. I met people who still had mold in their home over a year after the hurricane left, um, people who struggled to get uh, government resources to get back on their feet. And so it was through all of this that I learned that the environments that we live in, our access uh, to proper resources after uh, a crisis, our access to clean air, adequate housing, these all have a significant impact on our health you know, long before we stepped foot in the doctor's office. And so after graduating, I decided um, to continue working on, on those issues around uh, recovery after the hurricane, but I also decided to move back to Michigan to start focusing on clean air and clean water issues. In Michigan, we've had a lot of uh, challenges and we've been fighting back against issues like water shutoffs, pollution, um, among other challenges. And so I've realized that to get to the root cause of health disparities, and many other forms of injustice, we have to start uh, connecting these issues to climate and the, connecting these issues to environmental justice. This is an interesting and a tough question to answer because I don't think there's one particular moment, but a series of moments. Um, I've always held, um, I've always, you know, um, felt very close to nature and environmental spaces. I've always felt attracted to those spaces. As someone who's racialized as Black in my society, marginalized for various identity markers, um, and socialized in various ways by the society, um, there was a sense of peace that came from being in nature and feeling free to ex explore myself um, as a person, as a human, without those societal limitations or constrictions or judgments. Um, and so there's a great quote uh, by Christian Bobin that captures my feelings quite well. Um, and I will translate. But it says, J'aime appuyer ma main sur le tronc d'un arbre devant lequel je passe, non pour m'assurer de l'existence de l'arbre dont uh, je ne doute pas, mais de la mienne. I like to put my hand on the trunk of a tree that I am passing by, not to convince myself of the tree's existence. Um, because of that, I have no doubt, but to convince myself of my own. So I think that sort of captures that feeling that uh, that I had in nature. And so this love of nature evolved into an intellectual curiosity, uh, where I then sort of studied environmental science in university. Um, however, the messaging um, around environmental advocacy work did not, sit did not sit right with me. There's a lot of coding in the way that we spoke about the environment, the way that we spoke about um, what it means to be good for the environment that just, that wasn't for me, right? Messaging around depopulation that really sort of targeted Black folk or messaging around personal decisions without recognizing the privilege needed to make certain lifestyle choices. And, you know, I could go on. And so that sort of maintained my love for the environment at an intellectual level. Um, and then a couple of years later, in uh, my third year of my undergraduate degree, I actually took a course on sustainability. And our professor was a bit avant-garde um, and asked us for a final exam to change the world um, and send a proof so that you could grade it. 
or if we if we couldn't come up with anything, do a literature review. And so I decided to be very sort of authentic to myself and authentic to sort of what I knew and my interests. And so I grabbed a couple of friends and hosted an Adam and Eve style photo shoot um, in a in a green space, right? So sort of really making sure that we had computers and books and other sort of modern items while not really um, wearing uh, clothing. And so I titled this sort of photo composition, My Green Dream, this desire to reconnect humanity with nature without romanticizing the past. And um, I submitted the photos to uh, the United Nations Rio Plus 20 Conference of Sustainability that was happening that year in Brazil. And it got published on the website. And as a result of this one action, not only did I get an A in that class, but I also got named one of Canada's top 25 environmentalists under 25. And beyond the excitement of all of this, uh, this told me that my messaging resonated with people and that my environmental advocacy, my voice, my way of being of, of an advocacy that stems from the multiple identities that make me, me, was not only desired, but needed. So like many, uh, many people have said, it wasn't necessarily one thing that pulled me to the environment, but it was sort of realizing that multiple voices are needed to advocate for the environment so that we're not coding our messaging and creating almost this false dichotomy of what it means to be a person in nature and to care for the environment. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, as was just uh, mentioned, I think it's a clear demonstration that we do need multiple voices in order to address the climate crisis as well as uh, the environmental justice uh, issues around the world. And I know for myself at EPA, I need to learn from the youth in terms of suggestions that you might have how youth advocates and governments can work together. I'll just give one example. Um, next week, we have in the U.S. a White House uh, tribal Leaders Summit, where we're going to be meeting with uh, 574 tribal leaders around the country. EPA is honored to be co-chairing a uh, subcommittee on international indigenous issues. And one of the issues that we're trying to tackle with is how do we address environmental justice and climate change with our tribal nations. So I ask all of you, what suggestions do you have for how youth advocates like yourself and governments can work to work together. Um, and maybe if I could try going on the other side of the room and, and have Lasse start first this time. Okay. I think it's a tough question to ask, but I think it's also important to note it's a question of power of who's making the decisions. And I think to involve youth in work, you also need to give away some of the, your rights for, to decision making. Give youth position to actually uh, make decisions for our own futures. And I think that means giving position, giving work, giving money to youth organizations so they can speak for themselves, not through other elders. Uh, giving um, time and space like this where we actually can discuss issues not only about youth but about the issues as a whole. And I think we, it's lots of work to do. And I think why, when we are we're trying to solve issues that are way larger than we have seen before as humanity, and we know that the people who are politicians right now have been dealing with issues for 30, 40 years, and we have not seen action. We need to change something drastically in the way we organize our societies. And that means giving positions to youth and yeah, not only listen to our voices, but actually having the right to decide on our, our own futures. Thank you. Uh, Archana? Uh, for me, uh, what needs to be done is uh, being a young indigenous woman, I strongly feel that indigenous people should be leaders of climate actions and not victims of climate policies. When I say this, uh, I want to emphasize that it's really important to make sure that the indigenous people and the local communities are integral in the decision making process. Uh, we are trying to reach out to them because it's very difficult for them also to participate in the process because there is no structures in place and there is no enabling environment. So an effort from the leadership to reach out the people is really important. 
The second thing which is really important is also to ensure that how we are bridging the gap of env- uh, language barriers. Because, you know, often we all have been speaking about climate, uh, climate finance and we know how crucial it is. But most often we have also been speaking climate finance in the lens of infrastructure and technology. But we need basic dialogue and enabling environment and climate finance can also be used for making sure that we have interpretations for different communities coming together because often when you say interpretation people say it's costly it's there's no money but you know if we expense or if you spend money in also enabling dialogues wherein we are having the opportunity to share solutions where we have opportunity to share diverse perspective is really really critical and uh, the third thing which i would like to uh, emphasize when we are talking about indigenous people is to make sure that there is free prior and informed consent of indigenous people because that is often which is not taken into consideration and not acknowledged and the Last and the second thing which I would like to say that I feel really proud uh, to be part of UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. The most important reason is it's a free space, enabling space and a space where you can be completely honest, free, frank with Secretary General. I think we need more and more such uh, spaces with the leadership where young people can say anything and everything without any filter and the leadership is willing to listen to us and willing to take it as it is. Thank you. Nazi? Yeah, I think... um I will go a bit radical and say that we want to be this leadership. We don't want to engage with leaders. We don't want to talk to them so they can be our voices because we can be the leaders themselves here. I mean, but meantime, until we become the leaders, and I will count on all of your votes <laughs> if I run every day. <laughs> uh, until that time, if we don't really have this intergenerational dialogue between the current leaders and us then it means that we will work in different different places, we will work as silos, and this is not really going to help the case. Um, we have intelligence, innovative ideas, we have the future, we have the technology, uh, but unfortunately we don't have the decision-making power right now. And without this decision pick empowerment, uh, power, every action, every idea, every uh, um, actually uh, activism or advocacy we do is very small, limited, comparing to what can be happening. And I will just take the, the U.S. administrative for, for an example. Um, if something is coming from the president of the U.S., it's not like something coming from my colleague here in the uh, in the panel um, not because necessarily she doesn't know what she's, she's speaking about but necessarily is the hierarchy of the current system of, of power of influence of regulations for example um, it, it, it takes it takes months to take a decision to the Congress for example from a citizens but how long it takes to coming from the White House so um, mixing or matching the power um, that the policy makers and the world leaders have right now with the innovative ideas um, and um, the very intelligent ideas and also the very innovative uh, actions that young people are doing is the only way that we can actually find a way out. Otherwise we will just be um, not, I don't want to say wasting our time because of course it's not a waste, but unfortunately we are now in an urgency. If we did not have actions right now, then it will be too late to have actions in the future. And this is what we don't want to, we don't want to be late. Thank you. Alexandra? Yes, uh, this is actually, I've been asked quite a bit here at COP, why should young people be here? And I think that the reason why it's so important that young people are here at these conferences is because for a couple of reasons. And the first one is that our generation is going to be affected the most by any other generation before us. We have a huge generational inequality. So, for example, every aspect of our generation's life is going to be impacted by climate change from where we live, from where we go to school. A lot of young people are even having conversations about whether or not they want to have children. And that's all because of climate change. 
And so when we are the most affected generation, there's a sense of urgency that we convey when we're talking with our world leaders. We're the ones who are constantly reminding them what's the right thing to do and that we can't think inside of this box. And so the other thing is that young people are creative. We bring uh, different solutions and ideas to the conversation because we aren't yet ingrained in the sy system that a lot of adults are ingrained into. And so when we come to these conferences, we think about, well, we use our imagination. And I think that that is the most important thing is reimagining our future. And so when it comes to engaging young people, which is so important, I think that the first thing is to just engage them in conversations. I think that politicians and governments need to engage civil society more and activists and grassroots organizers specifically because a lot of local organizers and local community members know what needs to happen. To for, they know what the solutions they need to get in their community. So engage them. But then the other thing that I've been having more conversations about lately is creating youth advisory councils. So uh, a lot of statewide politicians and um, governors are talking about creating youth councils there to bring together youth and uh, talk more about the ideas and the solutions that they have. And I think that it's important to engage young people in conversations, but go even further than that. And so I think councils are a great example, but keep engaging the conversation and keep creating ways to amplify young people and make sure that um, you make space for them at the table. And if you don't make space, then I'm sure youth activists will make that space for ourselves. Alexandra. Justin. So I, I appreciate Alexandria's uh, comments um, in particular because I think when we talk about having young people engaged in this, it needs to be framed as a, as a, as a benefit and not just a, a duty uh, that leaders have. Young people have assets and have skills to bring to the table. And so I'm, I'm glad that it's been brought up in the discussion that engaging youth, making sure that environmental justice communities are at the table it's not just a box checking exercise, but something that can really help move us forward on climate, on environmental justice, and on so many other issues. Um, on your question of, of what can governments do, I think a couple of things. I think the first thing is making the connections between climate and other issues that are so important. You know, if you are a student that's learning in a polluted environment, chances are you're not going to learn as well as you would otherwise. If your home is located in an area of high pollution, chances are your home is not going to be worth as much as it would otherwise. Our economy itself um, is not strong if workers aren't productive, if they're not healthy, and if they're being exposed to dangerous and toxic environments. And so making that connection is critical. And the language and policies that governments use around environmental justice will determine if people get this, if people get that we have to tackle these issues as we tackle climate change. I think also we need to acknowledge history, we need to be honest, but we also need to bring people in. We need to make sure that everyone understands that everyone deserves access to clean air, clean water, and a healthy community. These values, I think, are universal, and we have to reject the false choices that tell us we have to choose between environmental justice and climate action. We have to reject the choices, the false choices that are given uh, that, that would suggest that we have to choose between environmental justice and good jobs. Um, Environmental justice should not be viewed as a, as a box checking exercise. Um, otherwise, it, it could lead to resentment and dampen genuine efforts to address all of the harms that I've mentioned. I think the second thing is that there, there needs to be active listening and understanding, uh, but that inclusivity must also come with action. I just started law school at, at Columbia, and one of the things that we're talking about in our constitutional law class is procedural due process versus substantive due process, which is the notion that due process not only protects certain legal procedures, but also protects certain rights uh, that are not related to procedure. And so it's true that we need to make sure that communities are brought in early in the process in the decision-making process. And our hope is that that will lead to a just outcome. But we also need to make sure that governments are making progress on the issues that we've talked about which are inequality, which is pollution, uh, which is the fact that climate change is impacting all of our communities and many of our communities in disproportionate ways. And so we need a uh, good process. We need to make sure that young people and environmental justice communities are engaged and at the decision-making table. But we also need to make sure that we are making progress every single day uh, that we can show people 
and that we can uh, can demonstrate in people's everyday lives. Um, last thing I'll say is just that government should not use the fact that all of these problems are difficult, they're intractable, they're generational problems, uh, but we should never use that as an excuse uh, to get bogged down in process or to not make uh, progress on, on substantial issues at all. Thank you. Uh, Chuck? This is a really uh, beautiful discussion. I've been learning a lot from hearing my fellow panelists speak. And so what I'd like to contribute to the discussion is sort of once again reemphasizing that idea of reframing governmental mindset, right? So um, speaking in a Canadian context, uh, my government has a very, frankly, a very bad habit of needing certain boxes checked off. And the need to check off boxes often takes away from the overall story of the overall point of view, right? So when we talk about climate change, when we talk about youth leadership, we're also still talking fundamentally about justice issues, right? A society that is still struggling with gender parity will not and will never be able to address the climate issue. A society that is struggling with racial injustice will never also be able to um, deal with climate issues. Because as human beings, we have a habit of personifying issues and we have a habit of personifying non-human entities. And the ways in which we personify those entities shapes the way we treat those entities, right? So we often personify in English and in French, and those are sort of Canada's um, two main languages. In English and French, we tend to personify nature as female. And so there's absolutely no way in a society that still struggles with gender parity and the gender page, uh, the gender wage gap and um, um, other issues that feminism is currently dealing with. There's no way a society like that is going to be, uh, is going to treat nature with the respect that nature is supposed to have, right? Or in a society where sort of nature and the environment are very heavily indigenized, right? We often attribute a lot of um, indigenous um, not necessarily indigenous perspectives, but we often have a habit of personifying the environment in indigenous ways. And if we are struggling to respect indigenous peoples, um, then it's, you know, it's very unlikely if at all possible that we'll be able to respect the environment that we've personified as indigenous. And so it's really key to sort of break down those silos and break down those boxes and learn and have government offices learn how to work with one another and, you know, learn that the Department of Health is absolutely intimately tied to the Department of the Environment, who is absolutely intimately tied to the Department of Immigration. These are these are fundamental issues that are obsolete together and um, no one department can sort of be left out of the discussion. And then to take it to a youth level, um, young people are as diverse as they come, right? We're as diverse as the trees, as the wind, as the air. And we have we hold many opinions, many knowledge bases, many levels of um, expertise. And as you can see, just from the people on this panel, uh, many different sort of ways of being, many different perspectives. And one of the mistakes that's often made when trying to engage with young people is to sort of take one young person, two young people, and say, well, now we have the youth voice. And that's not necessarily true. Right, because you can't take one 30 year old and say, now I have the adult voice. And so really recognizing that the table needs to be as diverse as the countries that you represent, making sure that in sort of um, referring to what Arshna was saying, making sure that everybody is invited to the table, everyone is welcome to the table, all the local communities are engaged and providing the supports that are necessary to be able to fully engage people, providing interpreters, ensuring linguistic justice, right? Because that's also sort of another key point is we're having all these discussions in English, which for many of us in this panel is a second, third, maybe even fourth language. And one of the difficulties of having a conversation in only one language is that we're limited to the forms of expression that that one language allows. And there are certain elements, certain key perspectives, mindsets, worldviews that don't translate very easily um, between languages. And so there's so many different um, issues when it comes to proper, meaningful engagement. And so sort of once again, echoing Justin, 
just because it's difficult and just because it's complicated does not mean we should not try, does not mean we should not make steps forward, does not mean that we cannot um, give trial and error a shot as well and, you know, make some mistakes and learn from those mistakes as we go along. But it is incredibly key and it's incredibly important that at every step of the way, every time a decision is made, once again, recognizing that we are not a society of um, individuals, we are a collectivity and every decision is a decision that is made by a collective of people that then impacts another collective of people. And so making sure that the engagement reflects the full diversity of the places, the nations, the peoples, the societies that you represent. Um, I think I'll stop there. This was certainly very inspiring. We only have five minutes left, and what I'd like to do is to ask each of the panelists, you have now an audience here in Glasgow, but you also have an international audience that's viewing. So what would your message be to youth who may be listening today, who perhaps have not been engaged in the climate uh, crisis and the environmental justice? What hopeful message would you give your youth who are listening today to get them to act, to become leaders like you are. So, Alexandra? I will try and keep this brief, but I do have a couple suggestions for anybody who wants to get involved in climate activism. And I think the, the first one is that you should find your climate story because we are being impacted by climate change all around the world all of us in different ways. So how are you being impacted by climate change? And then from there, find out what you want to do about it. Are you angry and do you want to take direct action or do you want to work on solutions and get involved in policy making? And so find out what your passions are. And then from there, find a group of people who are doing that, whether it's an organization um, or any other group who's, who's focusing on what you want to focus on. Because when you find a group of people to work with, then that makes doing this work so much uh, more fun. And we have to have fun with this because it's a marathon and uh, this is not a sprint. And so finding a people to do this with is so important. And so those are the three things. And then the last thing I want to say, though, is that now is the time to be an activist. And it's so much more easy to get involved than it looks. And so no matter how you get involved, we just need your voice. Thank you. Nazine? Yeah. Um, I always say that climate change impacts everyone differently. Um, so as Alexandra just mentioned, you have to find, first of all, how climate change is impacting you and the people around you and start there. Um, but my genuine advice to the, anyone who wants to, to start climate activism is to build your own capacity first. Because if you, can, if you don't know yourself, you cannot help your, the surrounding. If your capacities is not built enough, also you cannot build the surrounding capacities. Um, and sharing knowledge is always a very simple thing, but very powerful thing. Just have talks with your colleagues, with your neighbors, with your nephews, with your cousins and say this is climate change, I've learned this last week and it's impacting us like this and this. And everyone can actually have an action to stop climate change. It might be small but we are big. I mean so small actions in different individuals can really make a, a big uh, huge impact. And this doesn't mean that we will only focus on the um, individual actions and forget the policies also put a hell of a pressure on your governments, on the companies you have in your countries, in the private sector, uh, because we need both, unfortunately. We need both. We cannot succeed alone. We need individual actions, but we also need policies, governments, and private sector to do something about it. Thank you. Archana? Uh, yeah, to all the young people, uh, those who are watching us, I would like to say that, you know, the very fact that you are watching this interaction or video is that you're contributing towards the discourse. Because for me, the mere thought of acting itself is an action. And I would like to say you all that you are making difference and we will make difference because each contribution matters. And I would like to say that, you know, the very small act or act in 
whichever you are comfortable whether it is just simply writing a poem or you know painting dance or whatever you feel like doing whatever you are good at doing you can contribute towards climate action because there is one there's no one particular way to contributing there are multiple ways of contributing but what is important is to speak up in your own way in your own way to act which is comfortable for you which is comfortable in your own region because you know we need diverse people through diverse means and through diverse instruments of action so i just want to say that we are all proud of you all and we are all proud of each other being in the youth movement that we are contributing in our own way because you know we all are making difference thank you lasse thank you i would first say that this is my eighth panel discussion and it's been by far the best and it's because it's lots of young intellectual people talking and sharing their views and i would like to kindly ask you to treat us like the minister who you pay use a little too much time talking i think our discussion will be more interesting the one coming after us so uh to going to that what is my message to young people around the world i think it's to find your place where you can take space take the space because if you are not doing it then there will be an adult politician who may not share your views to do it may trust that you you are the one who can take that place and that you are the one who can deliver that message and do it in the way you are comfortable if it is through social media through actions through being a scientist but in any way, way where you're working to try to think how can i impact and what, what why am am i participating in this discussion uh, earlier this week i was asked before a panel discussion what do i want to get out of it not participate and think because you're asked and saying okay i'm going to deliver what they want always ask what do i want out of it what is my message for this conversation and i think that's important to note ignore don't be so shy about yourself uh, you are way better than many of the others in the discussion and we need to hear your voice thank you justin so i would i would say to young people across the world a couple of things i think number one is understanding that change is possible um whether it be progress on civil rights whether it be the fight against apartheid hiv aids activism or the broader labor movement that's protected workers and lifted wages it's this fusing between outside activist pressure and inside political pressure that has allowed great progress um throughout our nation's history and across the world to occur so understanding that history and placing yourself in a in a larger chain of of movements in history i think is is really reassuring for me and i think something that is helpful for, to other people who are looking to get engaged I think the second thing is understand that this is a lifestyle this is a is a a commitment. I think young people we are a generation that's been defined by crisis whether it be you know the financial crash uh whether it be climate change whether it's been the covid-19 pandemic we've gone through a lot and recognizing that in order to make progress given this context given the crisis that we face throughout our lifetime um it's going to take a lot we need to change the way we think about climate we need to change the way we talk about climate we need to change the way we legislate and enact policy change and if we're going to do this we need artists who are thinking about climate change we need policymakers who are thinking about climate change we need academics who are thinking about climate change differently and so making sure that you understand that this is a lifestyle and making sure that you understand that this needs to be sustainable i think is really important And the last thing I think is is understanding that in order to make progress on climate in order to make progress on environmental justice we have to do this work together. So start with organizations that that share and align with your values. Build bridges. We can't do this without a large enough co- a, a large coalition making progress on on each of the aspects that we've talked about today. And so building bridges with other communities that may not look like yours that may not be uh similar to you but have similar values. I think is really important. And the last thing is just make it fun. Um make it engaging. Make sure that you're getting out there with with other people who who are also interested in the work. So, understanding that change is possible, understanding that this fight for climate justice is a lifestyle and a long-term commitment, and then understanding that we have to do this work and we have to make progress together. I think are the three main things I would say to young people. Thank you. And last but not least, Chuck I 
love everything everyone has just said i think um it was spectacular and beautiful and um i'm really enjoying this so i think to add my voice to uh, to my fellow colleagues i would say being young is really interesting because you don't have you oftentimes not not speaking for everyone but you oftentimes you don't have fin the financial resource you don't have the time because you're in school you've got um, clubs you've got whatever else whatever else you have going on um and so it's often you know how do i contribute when i like both time and money and political power and so what i would say is when you're young it's the best time to reflect on who you are reflect on your identity reflect on your communities and <clears throat> figure out who um who are the communities that claim you and who are the communities that you belong to and where are your spheres of influence and also recognizing that you are in constant flux you are growing you will change you will um grow in knowledge and grow in talent and grow in power and grow in all these different things and so when you're able to recognize where you hold spheres of influence you're also able to recognize where that sphere of influence is going to grow and what kind of influence you would like to have when you're when your impact is large enough to be felt. So if you are a young person and you're like sitting there wondering how do I get involved, my first question to you is, do you know who you are? And what makes you you? What makes you tick? What makes you feel like you're authentically yourself? And how does your authentic self fit into the communities that you belong to, into the communities that claim you? How are those communities impacted by the host of issues that are being exacerbated by the climate crisis. And based off of all of that, what is the role that you want to play? What is the influence you want to have? What is the legacy that you want to live behind? Because no matter how young you are, you are a future ancestor. You're an ancestor to the next generation. And so, you know, what do you want to make sure that they have that you did not have? That's, uh, that's my advice. I think everyone would agree that this is one of the most exciting panels that I've been at COP26. And I have to say, uh, I've done a number of ministerial meetings, and this is far more exciting than many of the ministerial meetings uh, that I have attended. So I would like to uh, ask everyone to join me in a round of applause for this outstanding panel. Thank you. So I just wanted to say that I think many of us are ready to vote for you and to hand over the reins to you. So because you are not the future leaders, you are the leaders. So thank you. Thank you again.